Hello and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 9, Project Mercury Wrap-Up and Choosing the Moon. This episode is going to be a little different than the previous six. Over the last 12 weeks, we've taken a look at each of the six manned missions of Project Mercury in detail, but haven't really had a chance to look at the program overall. Before leaving NASA's first manned spaceflight program behind, I wanted to take some time to do a quick revisit and re-examine how Project Mercury got started, how each of its flights fit into the bigger picture, and what its lasting legacy is. At this point in our narrative, I think it's easy to take Project Mercury for granted. Anyone who is interested in spaceflight is familiar with the story of NASA, a civilian agency, flying test pilots in non-lifting, capsule-shaped spacecraft. But Project Mercury was not obvious or inevitable. Rather, it is the product of competing agencies both within the government and within what was then still NACA, a reflection of theoretical knowledge at the time, and of course, the geopolitical climate. Some of the historical what-if scenarios that almost came to fruition are fascinating. The Air Force tried to rush a piloted spaceflight program into production and gain a foothold in space before NASA could be formed and claim space for itself. The Army proposed using a Redstone missile to launch a manned spacecraft on suborbital missions similar to the early Mercury flights, but instead of an escape tower, in the event of an emergency, the pilot would be fired into a nearby pool of water and there was pressure both from within NACA and industry to choose a spacecraft that would have at least some lifting capability, allowing for guided re-entries, more precise landings, and cross-range capability. These alternate capsule configurations are especially interesting. Some are truly bizarre. For instance, one proposed a stainless steel mesh parachute for control during entry, but some are clearly in the same vein as what would later become the Space Shuttle. A sort of Super X-15 was among these. So, with so many choices, how did we end up with a non-lifting ballistic capsule? It was chosen because it was the easiest and most straightforward. This served two purposes. It made our first human spaceflight program simpler and more likely to succeed, and it also improved our chances of beating the Soviet Union into space. Each of the proposed designs had their own pros and cons, with the capsule's main pro being that it's simplest to build and fly. With that decision, I believe Project Mercury set the tone for human spaceflight for the next 20 years. Do what's simplest and most pragmatic, even if it isn't necessarily the best long-term option. Of course, even in modern spaceflight, nothing is done just for the sake of it, but at this early stage, and with stiff competition, it made sense to focus on the simplest, most straightforward way of getting things done. Lifting bodies, winged spacecraft, and reusability come with all sorts of benefits, but are tricky to pull off and weren't strictly necessary, so they had to wait. Much like the spacecraft that would fly its missions, Project Mercury itself was pretty simple and pragmatic. It was created with the goal of orbiting a man around the world three times and safely recovering him. That's it. Not that that's an easy task, it obviously wasn't, but compared to the missions we'll be getting into shortly, it's almost quaint in its scope. It went on to fly 20 development missions on a variety of launch vehicles and with a variety of instrumentation, or animals, on board, and six manned missions. I like to think of each flight in Project Mercury as answering a specific question. This is one nice thing about the early space program. Between Mercury's initial exploration and Gemini and Apollo's race to the moon, every mission had to tackle one specific problem and answer it as quickly as possible. When we get to the shuttle era, while there are still flights like that, they become so packed with activities that they're harder to clearly define. So what are the six questions Project Mercury answered? First, with Freedom 7, the question was, can we even do this at all? Having just come off the Faith 7 episode, it is incredible to compare the first and final flight in Project Mercury. Freedom 7 spent barely five minutes in space, and the entire mission was so short that I included the full air-to-ground radio as a supplemental in an early episode. But it was exactly what the fledgling program needed in order to get the ball rolling. Alan Shepard piloted his spacecraft, the first human to do so, by the way, and proved the Mercury capsule was capable of supporting the astronaut during his brief flight. Next, Liberty Bell 7 really answered two questions. The intended question was, can we do that again? Mercury Redstone 4 was a near-identical mission to Mercury Redstone 3, but was a crucial step on the way to the first orbital flight. 
During his brief time in space, astronaut Gus Grissom was able to confirm that Shepard's flight was not a fluke, while also successfully field testing the manual proportional attitude control system. The second unintended question Liberty Bell 7 answered was, can we handle an emergency? Sure, the unexpected firing of the capsule's escape hatch could have been handled better, and they did lose the spacecraft. But at the end of the day, Gus Grissom was safe and sound, and new lessons were learned. While we're on the topic of Liberty Bell 7, I just wanted to quickly mention that nearly 40 years after sinking to the seafloor, the spacecraft was actually recovered by internet shopping mogul and leader of new space company Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos. Good job, Jeff. Friendship 7 comes next, and is perhaps the most well-known of the Mercury flights. On this flight, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. There are a few different ways to phrase the question that this flight answered. But the main two are, can we do what we set out to do? Or perhaps, can we match the Soviets? And in the same spirit of Liberty Bell 7, it also unexpectedly answered, can we improvise, when it seemed that the vehicle's heat shield may have come loose? With Aurora 7, the question was, can we use this for science? And I'd say the answer was yes, but you need to plan better. Constant changes to the mission plan, as well as failing to keep the overall sequence of events in mind, led to a flight that was nearly guaranteed to have problems. The fact that the pilot was apparently easily distracted didn't help. This flight seems to have given the manned spaceflight engineers a somewhat unfair aversion to science, and emphasized the importance of a coherent and reliable mission plan. Next up is Sigma-7, answering the question, can we do this better? The previous two orbital flights had been successful, but with an undesirable level of drama. Both had landed with no fuel remaining and experienced major mission-threatening events. The goal of Sigma-7 was to have a nice, boring flight that repeated the feats of the previous two, but in a way that was smoother, calmer, and more efficient. Sigma-7 was, of course, hugely successful and paved a way for the next flight, Faith-7. Faith-7 answered the simple question, can we do this for a full day? But I think the real question was, are we ready for the next step? There was talk about a three-day Mercury mission, Mercury Atlas 10, which would have been commanded by Alan Shepard, but it was never seriously pursued. With Faith 7, NASA had wrung as much out of the Mercury spacecraft as could be reasonably expected. They had far surpassed their early meager goals, and it was clearly time to take the next step with Project Gemini. At the end of Project Mercury, what did we have? I'd say the three main things we had gained were experience, infrastructure, and prestige. The experience gained over the course of Project Mercury was crucial to the future success of the space program. There were so many things we simply didn't know we didn't know. How to properly organize a mission from the ground, how to build a flight manifest that works, how to recover spacecraft, and much, much more. These things could not be learned in any way but by doing, and we did it. When I say infrastructure, I mean both the physical assets as well as the political structure that now existed. The first studies in demand spaceflight were done under the auspices of the military and a few dreamers at NACA. Launch and tracking infrastructure existed, but not on the scale required for human spaceflight. And there was no central organization responsible for the peaceful exploration of space. Fast forward to the end of the Project Mercury, and all of that was in place or rapidly being built. The space program was no longer a small twig jutting off a much larger branch of the government, but rather it was a branch of its own. They had gained the breathing room required to take longer strides. And lastly, prestige. Because we had answered the challenge of the Soviets and taken a strong stance on the future of space. We weren't able to match them quite yet, but with Project Mercury, we showed we were more than capable of excelling in this new arena. Our performance in Project Mercury was certainly impressive, but our stance on the future of spaceflight was just crazy. On May 25th, 1961, just 20 days after America's first short spaceflight, President Kennedy challenged the nation to land a man on the surface of the moon and safely recover him by the end of the decade. But how did we get to that point? Let's take a quick step back. It's important to remember that people basically completely freaked out about the Soviets' early lead in space. America was still fresh off of World War II and felt like it could do anything it wanted with its superior technology. 
that was our thing. Freedom, technology, capitalism, the future, apple pie, you get the picture. Then suddenly one day, Sputnik happens and changes all of that. The Russians were in space, and we were not. And sure, we got our own satellite up there after a few months and a few failed attempts, but the Russians had beaten us to it. So NASA is formed, and Project Mercury gets started, and we start making steady progress, and the Russians beat us again. This time we were actually trying. This clearly wasn't just a fluke. So now imagine that you're President Kennedy in this situation. You're a young politician trying to bring an invigorating energy to your leadership over the world's number one nation. Now in front of the whole world, the Russians are proving that in this ultimate demonstration of high technology, they had us beat. From a foreign policy standpoint, other nations would start to look at the situation and think, hmm, maybe there is something to this communism thing after all. From a domestic point of view, the American people would lose confidence in their country, and that would have repercussions in any number of areas. Kennedy was no great lover of space. I give him all the credit in the world for making the decision he's about to make, but I want that on the record. Kennedy's stance on space was that it was a highly visible metric of the capability of a nation, and he wanted to make sure that if anyone was going to be doing it, we were doing it best. Unmanned spacecraft clearly had their place, and I'm sure he wished he had a few more spy satellites instead of U-2s in the years to come. But Kennedy viewed manned spaceflight as a waste of money that could be put to use on more important issues. But with the rest of the world using it as a way to size up nations, and with the control of a new frontier at stake, Kennedy could simply not shy away from this battle, no matter how disinterested he may have been. This brings us to the moon landing. Kennedy asked, what space-related goal was sufficiently far away that we would have time to overcome the Soviets' early lead and beat them to it? The answer was the moon. It required the development of new technologies, new techniques, and a strong coordination between government and industry. Plus, it would take at least six years. If we chose to go to the moon and applied ourselves at full speed, we should be able to get there before the Russians. This decision was not quite as popular as you might think in some corners of NASA. The Apollo program is often looked back on as the high watermark for American achievement in space, which isn't quite fair, but that's another point. Without being too much of a downer, let me be clear. The Apollo program was a completely unsustainable crash program that set NASA up for an uncertain second step after that first small one. I'm not saying it was the wrong decision, and I'm not saying we should regret the Apollo program but it put a nuclear-powered spotlight on not only human spaceflight, but one specific aspect of human spaceflight. Reusable spacecraft, space stations, advanced propulsion, and a good amount of science would all fall by the wayside in favor of the all-consuming need to land on the moon by the end of the decade. I'll talk more about that during the Apollo episodes, but I thought it was important to make clear why some NASA folks might be a little wary of this goal, even while others at the space agency, and across the nation, we're ecstatic over it. One of the seminal moments of the space race was President Kennedy's speech given at Rice University on September 12, 1962, just a few weeks before the flight of Sigma 7. I considered reading a portion of the speech, as I did for Kennedy's words for Congress, but I couldn't bring myself to truncate this exceptional oration. I also didn't feel like I could do it justice with my own reading, so I've included here the full audio of President Kennedy's speech. I almost put it in a supplemental, but it's so core to this early phase of the space program that I decided to just include it in the main episode. However, it is about 18 minutes long, so no hard feelings if you want to skip ahead. Alright, here it is. President Tipton, Mr. Vice President, Governor, Congressman Thomas, Senator Wiley and Congressman Miller, Mr. Webb, Mr. Bell, scientists, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate uh, your president having made me an honorary visiting professor, and I will assure you that my first lecture will be uh, very brief. I am delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be here on this occasion. We meet at a college noted for knowledge, in a city noted for progress, in a state noted for strength. And we stand in need of all three. For we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, 
in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists that the world has ever known are alive and working today, despite the fact that this nation's own scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years in a rate of growth more than three times that of our population as a whole, despite that, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of about a half a century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced man had learned to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during this whole 50 year span of human history, the steam engine, provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephone and automobiles and airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin and television and nuclear power. And now if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. This is a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. New ignorance, new problems, new dangers. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships as well as high reward. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait. But this city of Houston, this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. <laughs> this country was conquered by those who moved forward and so will space. William Bradford, speaking in 1630 of the founding of the Plymouth Bay Colony, said that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties, and both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Those who came before us made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution, the first waves of modern invention, and the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. the eyes of the world now look into space to the moon and to the planets beyond and we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest 
but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. In short, our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men, and to become the world's leading space-faring nation. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. It is for these reasons that I regard the decision last year to shift our efforts in space from low to high gear as among the most important decisions that will be made during my incumbency in the office of the presidency. In the last 24 hours, we have seen facilities now being created for the greatest and most complex exploration in man's history. We have felt the ground shake and the air shattered by the testing of a Saturn C-1 booster rocket, many times as powerful as the Atlas which launched John Glenn, generating power equivalents to 10,000 automobiles with their accelerator on the floor we have seen the site where five F-1 rocket engines, each one as powerful as all eight engines of the Saturn combined, will be clustered together to make the advanced Saturn missile assembled in a new building to be built at Cape Canaveral as tall as a 48-story structure, as wide as a city block, and as long as two lengths of this field. Within these last 19 months, at least 45 satellites have circled the Earth. Some 40 of them were made in the United States of America, and they were far more sophisticated and supplied far more knowledge to the people of the world 
than those of the Soviet Union. The Mariner spacecraft... <laughs> the Mariner spacecraft, now on its way to Venus, is the most intricate instrument in the history of space science. The accuracy of that shot is comparable to firing a missile from Cape Canaveral and dropping it in this stadium between the 40-yard lines. Transit satellites are helping our ships at sea to steer a safer course. Tyra satellites have given us unprecedented warnings of hurricanes and storms and will do the same for forest fires and icebergs. We have had our failures, but so have others, even if they do not admit them, and they may be less public. To be sure, <laughs> to be sure we are behind, and will be behind for some time in manned flight. But we do not intend to stay behind, and in this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. The growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, and the home as well as the school. Technical institutions such as Rice will reap the harvest of these gains. And finally, the space effort itself, while still in its infancy, has already created a great number of new companies and tens of thousands of new jobs. Space and related industries are generating new demands in investment and skilled personnel. And this city and this state and this region will share greatly in this growth. What was once the furthest outpost on the old frontier of the West will be the furthest outpost on the new frontier of science and space. Houston, your city of Houston, with its manned spacecraft center, will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community. During the next five years, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration expects to double the number of scientists and engineers in this area to increase its outlays for salaries and expenses to $60 million a year, to invest some $200 million in plants and laboratory facilities, and to direct or contract for new space efforts over $1 billion from this center in this city. To be sure, all this costs us all a good deal of money. This year's space budget is three times what it was in January 1961 and it is greater than the space budget of the previous eight years combined. That budget now stands at $5,400,000,000 a year, a staggering sum, though somewhat less than we pay for cigarettes and cigars every year. Space expenditures, <laughs> space expenditures will soon rise some more from 40 cents per person per week to more than 50 cents a week for every man, woman, and child in the United States. For we have given this program a high national priority, even though I realize that this is in some measure an act of faith and vision. For we do not now know what benefits await us. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communication, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, 
causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first. Before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. I'm the one who's doing all the work, so uh, we just want you to stay cool for a minute. However, I think we're going to do it. And I think that uh, we must pay what needs to be paid. I don't think we ought to waste any money, but I think we ought to do the job. And this will be done in the decade of the 60s. It may be done while some of you are still here at school at this college and university. It will be done during the terms of office of some of the people who sit here on this platform. But it will be done, and it will be done before the end of this decade. And I am delighted that this university is playing a part in putting a man on the moon as part of a great national effort of the United States of America. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said, because it is there. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. Kennedy does a superb job of laying out the case for both manned and unmanned spaceflight. I honestly get chills listening to this speech, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. Kennedy firmly set the nation's sights on the moon, but in order to get to the moon, we're gonna have to develop some new techniques and capabilities. The most important of these were orbital rendezvous, getting two vehicles in orbit to gently meet in space, extravehicular activity, usually known as spacewalks, and long duration flight, and the moon's pretty far away. As Project Mercury wound down, NASA turned its attention to the program that would teach us these techniques, Project Gemini. But before the first flight of Gemini, another corner of NASA slipped the surly bounds of Earth. So join me in two weeks to learn about the experimental rocket plane that paved the way for the future space shuttle, the X-15. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>